before we were saying that the property of the electron can't really be described using particle equations, but it requires some kind of a wave-like equations. The reason for this is because we find that the electron behaves like a wave in several different types of experiments. So, uh, however, the type of wave that should be used to describe the electron is not just any kind of wave, but it has to be a wave that somehow is similar to the way the electron behaves, which is the fact that the electron is always bound to the nucleus. So remember earlier we were talking about the Broglie as being the person who proposed matter can also have wavelength, and then he was proven to be correct by experimental results of diffraction. Now he proposed that if the electron is really something that behaves like a wave, then we should use something call a standing wave to model the electron correctly. So this slide explains what a standing wave is. You have two people holding a string, for example, and you start to move it up and down to generate a wave-like motion. Then that type of wave will be called a standing wave. So in other words, it's a wave that has fixed ends. Okay. Uh, what are examples of this in real life? So when you're playing a guitar, when you're playing a violin, you're really generating a number of standing waves. Aside from being fixed, Standing waves can only vibrate at certain frequencies. These are known as the tone for that particular vibration. So the lowest frequency you can make a standing wave vibrate would be something that looks like this right here, where basically you just have one half a wavelength of vibration. In a musical instrument, this will be what we call a fundamental tone. And the overtones are basically the higher frequency vibration. In other words, this is the lowest frequency you can make uh, a standing wave. Then you can also generate higher frequency. As you can see here, we have more wavelengths, right? So that would mean higher frequency. Wavelengths are uh, shorter in this case, so the frequency is higher, okay? Another unique property, a standing wave can only form when there are whole number multiple of half wavelengths, okay? What do I mean by that? If you look at these drawings right here, for this standing wave to form, I have one half of lambda, okay? Right? Because this is not a whole wave, but this is only one half of uh, a wavelength, okay? So in other words, n is equal to one in this case, and then uh, this is lambda over 2. Uh, you can also make another standing wave if you happen to make two of these guys. Okay, so this is then a standing wave that's formed by two half a wavelength, and this is, would be a standing wave that's formed by three half a wavelength. Okay, now let's see a demonstration of a uh, standing wave formation so you'll really, you know, you believe that the standing wave would always have whole number multiple of half wavelength. So in this demonstration, these two people here are holding uh, a string and they're going to move it up and down to generate a standing wave. And I want you to pay careful attention to uh, how this wave is generated and how many um, half wavelengths are generated when the wave vi vibrates at a certain frequency. This is the fundamental mode. Sending the pulse at twice the frequency. So I want you to pay careful attention here as this standing wave is being generated. You can see that it has that same exact pattern that we saw earlier when we're talking about the fact that now this particular higher frequency has two half wavelengths, right? So this is one half, this is the other one half. So it has two half wavelengths in this case. If I triple the frequency, I get the third harmonic. I hope you can see it pretty clearly. Now you have three half wavelengths. One, two, and three. For a standing wave to form at whole number multiple of half wavelengths. Either one half wavelength, two half wavelengths, three half wavelengths, four half wavelengths, five, and so on and so forth. The last thing I want to comment about standing wave is the fact that they have certain regions in the standing wave that have zero amplitude. So for example, here for this particular standing wave, and here and here for, these two, for this particular standing wave. These regions are known as nodes for the standing waves, and this becomes an important idea later on when we're discussing uh, the model of the electron. Let's first talk about why standing wave is a good model for the electron. Remember what we said earlier. The electron is a particle that's held fixed 
by the attractive force of the nucleus. So in other words, the electron doesn't just travel away from the atom, but it stays fixed inside the atom because the nucleus is holding on to it. Standing wave is really a good model for it because the standing wave is a wave whose ends are also fixed. Let's now look at the uh, standing waves again and look at how that could be used to represent the electron. Okay, so again earlier this would be an unplugged string that has fixed ends. Uh, and then this would be the first lowest frequency possible for that particular standing wave to form, which is one half wavelength as shown right here. This would be two half wavelengths and so on. Why is that an important idea for the model of the electron? Well, as it turns out, it pretty much explains why electron can only be located at certain positions. And the reason is the following. The only way a standing wave can form is that if it has whole number multiple of half a wavelengths. Okay, so here you have two half wavelengths. Here you have one, two, three, four half wavelengths, and so on and so forth. Now the idea is the following. You can see here that I wouldn't be able to get another whole number half wavelengths if I didn't extend this long enough. So in other words, if I just cut my length right here, I'm not going to be able to get a standing wave. What I get is not a standing wave because remember a standing wave has to have whole number of half wavelengths. So in other words I need to extend the distance. Let's say here's my nucleus. I need to extend the distance here before I get one standing wave. I need to extend the distance here before I get another standing wave. I need to extend it from here to here before I get another standing wave. Automatically if you take this scripts right here and you uh, roll it so it surrounds the nucleus, what you'll see is these type of structure, right? Where each one of this is a strip that represents one standing wave. Now of course this is what we see in the Bohr model. Bohr, remember, he couldn't quite explain why the electron has to be located at those uh, restricted locations. He just said that in order for the model to predict the spectral lines, I have to have the electron fixed at these locations. Now with the wave model for the electron, we can clearly see why they need to be at specific locations. The reason is because if you're not at those restricted locations, a standing wave cannot form. So let's wrap this up by talking about the equation that models the electron as a standing wave. Okay, This was developed by Schrodinger. The mathematical equation that represents the electron itself, because it's using a wave to model the electron, is called the wave function and it's given the symbol psi, okay, the Greek letter psi. And at this particular point when Schrodinger developed the equation, uh, the wave function is also not well understood. It allows you to predict how the interference pattern of the electron comes about, but there is no good interpretation of what the wave function represents. Max Born, who won the Nobel Prize in 1954, he was the one to propose that this wave function it basically allows us to calculate the probability of finding the electron at a particular position. So if you imagine the nucleus to be a space, uh, the atom to be a space and inside it there is an electron, okay, what you can do is you can say, okay, I want to know what the position of the electron is at a particular uh, location. I can't know that. What I can know is that if at this location, what is the probability of finding the electron? So I want to wrap this up by showing you what exactly the Born interpretation of the wave function is. Finally, a physicist named Max Born came up with a new and revolutionary idea for what the wave equation described. Born said the wave is not a smeared out electron or anything else previously encountered in science. Instead, he declared it's something that's really peculiar, a probability wave. That is, Born argued that the size of the wave at any location predicts the likelihood of the electron being found there. As weird as it sounds, this new way of describing how particles like electrons move is actually right. When I throw a single electron, I can never predict where it will land. But if I use Schrodinger's equation to find the electron's probability wave, I can predict with great certainty that if I throw enough electrons, then say 33.1% would end up here, 7.9% would end up there, 
and so on. These kinds of predictions have been confirmed again and again by experiments. And so the equations of quantum mechanics turn out to be amazingly accurate and precise, so long as you can accept that it's all about probability.